Thank you all for coming to this talk. My name is Hanno Emrechts. Um, I work as an IT consultant based in the Netherlands, and my company is called InfoSupport. And last summer, summer of 21, uh, my boss asked me, would you be interested in upgrading your Java certification? And I said, well, I've been a Java developer for over 14 years. Surely the certification can't hold any secrets from me any longer. Uh, but well, I had previously achieved the Java 5 uh, certification, so it was a bit outdated. Um, uh, but my boss said it will help us win a bit because we are uh, competing in a bit uh, to provide Java training, uh, uh, Java training programs for one of our customers. And being able to tell them that our old teachers are Java 11 certified, or at least the most recent version, will help us win this, uh, this project, get this project. And in the end, we got the project, so I like to think that my certification had anything to do with that uh, at all. Um, and uh, while I was studying for the test, I came across lots of things that actually surprised me. Things that I couldn't reproduce, reproduce uh, by heart, even, if, even with these 14 years of experience. And uh, it was like a list of 50 items or something that I couldn't reproduce comfortably. Um, I've compiled them into a list of 11 things that I want to show you right now. Uh, which means this is an opportunity for you to learn 11 crazy things that I came across during studying for the Java certification uh, in 15 minutes, because this is a 15-minute session. And I, it took over 14 years for me to learn and, and, and grasp the concept. So that's about 500 times quicker than I learned it. So I'm offering this opportunity to you. Uh, I hope that you will uh, make the most of it. It will certainly be fast, 11 things in 15 minutes, 14 minutes actually now. So, um, but there will be a link on the final slide. Well, I only have two slides, see, the rest is demo. So this link at the top, you, will, you can follow to uh, get to the GitHub project. I will show it uh, at the end also. And you can try these 11 crazy things out for yourself and uh, maybe try to solve them also. So sorry if a few things will go very fast, but I have to in this case. Um, and I can't do this talk when Java 17 certification will be upgraded because how can I fit 17 things in 15 minutes, right? So it's a one-time opportunity, right? So let's dive into it. And uh, the structure of the talk is quite simple. I've created 11 test suites that are mostly failing. Not all of them, but I'll get to that in a minute. But Almost all of them are failing. I, I just need to make sure that they will pass, that they will succeed. And in the process, we'll learn lots of things. So number 11 is a few, a few freaky ways to declare and initialize arrays. Uh, the first assertion wants an array of size 2, right? Um, but in this case, it's equal to null. So let's uh, comment this line out and just say, uh, create a new array. But I would really want to use the var keyword that was introduced in Java 11. It turns out you can't use it this way because var is a generic concept, so you can't say it's an, it's an array of var, it just has to be var like this, and then it works. In the second method, I was playing with the C-style array. I'm not sure if ever anyone uses this, but Java supports this. Provide the square, square brackets after the variable name, and not here after the int, right? And I thought, well, let's just create a list of two int arrays, and add the second array also. But then I made... Uh, a judgment error because this is actually not an array. It's a primitive int because it repeats this data type and not this one. This is only for specific to array one. So if I want the comma separation in um, initialization here, I need to do it like that. And then the test will succeed. Number 10 is about three elements that don't implement comparable. So I've created um, a list of talks. They are by all kinds of Looney Tunes characters. Uh, Tweety is talking about banning all cats off the internet. Well, we don't want that, but Tweety does. Um, and um, we want to sort this list of talks, this stream of talks, and collect them and uh, uh, return a, a set. But if you run this, uh, Java will tell you class cast exception. They want talk to be comparable. I thought this, this was quite a, a puzzling exception. Um, and if you see it, you might think, what do I have to change? Well, actually, this sorted method uh, demands that the element that you're sorting implements comparable. So in order to fix this, we need to make sure that our talk class implements comparable. Comparable generic type talk. Then we can implement the compare to method, compare to another talk, and we can, for example, um, compare by speaker name. Doesn't really matter, but like this. 
and then it will succeed. I only have time to execute the test once at the, f at the end of the talk, so bear with me for a second. I really hope that they will all be green at the end. <laughs> Number nine is accessing static interface method. I, s I thought I knew everything there was to know about interfaces. Um, and in this case, we're still working with talks, but talk is in this case implementing a slot interface. And the slot interface holds a static uh, cons, uh, uh, of course a static int, because all variables in interfaces are implicitly static. Uh, so it's just the length of the slot. But there's also a static method that provides a description of this slot. This lasts less for 50. I, I, I hoped I had 50 minutes for this, but it's 15, sadly. Um, Crazy thing is, you can access length in minute by using the interface name um, or uh, a, a variable that refers to a class that implements the interface, but you can't refer to the static method. That's, that's quite strange, I thought. So I can assert that cards are awesome dot length in minutes. I can just access this, this static variable, but I can't access this static interface method. Also, not when I use the class uh, name. I have to use the exact interface name like this, like this. And then it compiles. I never knew this. It took me 14 years. It took you four minutes. So, well done to you. Creating anonymous subclasses in an enum definition. Yes, you can. I never knew that. So, I have created a few methods that tell you when will the next DevOx UK be. After this one, it will be in 2023. Uh, the next Java one, and my personal favorite, because I'm from the Netherlands, the next JFAL, which is... Uh, in my opinion, the best one-day conference we know. I'm not hating on DevOx UK here because it's, it runs for three days, right? So the best one-day conference we know. Um, so in the assertions, we want all descriptions to be the same. The next conference will take place in a year. It will take place in a certain venue or a certain location. But with JFOL, I want to have this additional text. It is the best uh, one-day conference we know. Uh, but currently, it's not, it's not returning this. And this test case, this is the only test case that is failing, actually. And we can fix this by um, using a, an anonymous subclass in this enum definition. So in this enum definition, I can just provide an implementation and just say, override methods, when is the next? And I can just change the behavior right here. I never knew this. When would you use this? I'm not sure, but now you know. Now you know. Division by zero, number seven. I always used to think that division by zero that causes arithmetic exceptions, right? You can't divide by zero. But it's not, that's not always the case. You can, um, for example, if you um, divide floats or doubles, you get a different result. They don't throw an arithmetic exception, actually. So let's change this assertion to assert that divide. So this divide method is actually an overload. It's an in primitive version, a float primitive version, and a double primitive version. Uh, it doesn't throw any exception. Um, we just have to make sure that it's equal to a float dot positive infinity. There were actually, there was an exam question on this. I was really glad that I uh, learned this during the practice exams, because otherwise I wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have passed it, I think. And for double, it's the same. So if you divide by zero for a double, you get a positive infinity constant back as a result. Number six, method overloading priorities. They are all over the place. Well, actually, there are, there's a set of very specific rules, but you have to memorize them, right? So um, I've created three assertions here, and um, um, they are all regarding a method print sum. So there's a print sum method, and I've created overloads. So there's a double primitive version. I've created overloads for integer and for an int var arc uh, per parameter. Um, and there are three assertions, but only one of them is true. Um, and actually, my IDE is giving it away already, because what will uh, be called when you, um, when you call print sum for two int literals? I always thought boxing to an integer uh, class type would be prefer preferred, but actually widening is preferred. So the int gets widened to a double, and that's why this method will be called. However, if you wouldn't have this method, then it would be boxed. You can see why the IDE is helping us out here. So why should you learn this stuff by heart, right? Um, and if you don't have the integer over, uh, overload, then finally the var arc parameter will be, will be used. So to fix this, we actually have to delete the assertions um, that, are, that are wrong, right? Don't do this, uh, don't do this at work. <laughs> but I'm doing it right now, so that you don't have to at work. 
let's delete the, the assertions that, were, that we wrongly uh, added to it. Number five, the crazy stuff that is allowed in switch statements. I've created a method with a switch statement that converts a character, a character which is the talk rating, in this case uh, um, denoted by letters A, B, C, or D. Uh, a is a great talk, B is a good talk, average talk for C and D, and anything below means it's a bad talk. You can make up your mind about my talk later, of course. Um, this actually was a practice exam question. And uh, I've used a parameterized te uh, test here, and all cases are succeeding except for C and D. Something strange is going on there. Um, on, upon further inspection, it turns out that this is not an OR operator. This is a bitwise operator. And what happens with a bitwise operator in this case, C equals 99 in an integer representation, D equals 100. With the binary representation, the ones become ones, the zeros stay zeros. Well, actually, we're testing for G instead of C or D. Uh, that's a nasty one, right? So let's um, fix it by using the fall through here. There, that should fix it. Never use this in switch cases. <laughs> Equality when dealing with cloned arrays, number four. I've created an array um, of talks again. These are my tips for the talks uh, for the remainder of the day. Uh, one also by myself and by a colleague, Peter Vessels, at uh, four o'clock about pattern matching. And there's also one by Kelly Gilly at uh, 5 p.m., which I thought looked very interesting. So a uh, free conference talk uh, tips uh, right here. But um, about the arrays, uh, where we have a method that just returns the talk array, and there's a method that run returns a clone of the talks array. And what do we expect in this test? Well, actually, I thought these two objects will probably be equal. Well, they're not, because it's a double equals operator, and the clone uh, represents a new object on the heap. So this can never be true. It should be false. But then, the contents of this array, will they also uh, be different? Well, they won't, because it's a shallow clone in the case of an array. So actually, the original talks are contained in the cloned, in the cloned array. So that's one to keep track of, to keep in mind. Wrapper objects, some are more equal than others. Well, they are. So just for sanity, let's assert that an equality of 200 and 300 uh, yields false, right? It's just the double equals operator again. 200 is not equal to 300. I think we can all agree. Um, but if you are testing 200 against 200, well, then it yields false because um, they are new objects, again, separate objects on the heap. So for integer um, primitives, this would return true, but for wrapper objects, it returns false. However, and in this case, I, I really lost it. I lost it because how can 10 and 10 be true again? I, I, I didn't have a clue, and then I learned that Java re reuses some wrapper objects. Um, to make sure that, uh, you know, to, to save on memory, actually. So all short and integer values within these bounds are reused. So if you provide 10, then it will be equal again. That crazy stuff, right? <laughs> crazy stuff. It's a miracle I passed this exam, after all. Um, functional interfaces, they like, they like questions about functional interfaces. I always uh, thought that a functional interface was an interface with just a single abstract method so that you could use it in a lambda expression. So just for sanity, can it also be an abstract class? No, it cannot be an abstract class. It has to be an actual interface. So this is an example of a functional interface that is valid, a, a speaker that just has an abstract speak method. Uh, a badge, I don't have it on me, but badges tend to flip right, the wrong, the wrong way up, right? So uh, this has a default void flip. The badge has flipped again. Yeah, this gentleman has the same problem right here. Um, this also has one abstract method, because the flip method is a default implementation, so it doesn't count towards the abstract method limit. However, is this one a functional interface? It extends speaker, which was this one, and it turns out it's not, because it adds another abstract method, so it's not a functional interface, because now it has two. Um, byte size speaker, then, has a default implementation, has a uh, uh, of speak has an abstract method, but it overrides the existing speak abstract method. So in this case, speak doesn't count towards abstract methods, and this one does. So it's actually a functional interface. And I really lost it at this final, final one. I got turned upside down and inside out after learning this. Crazy. I mean, um, this is uh, the interface room, and it has an abstract method book, but these methods are inherited from object. 
and they don't provide any implementation right here. And because they are inherited from object, they don't count towards the abstract method limitation. So this is, an this is a functional interface after all. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. Final one, maybe this is just because I, um, I prefer Labdas to method reference in most cases, but I never learned this in 14 years. Well, of course, Java 8 hasn't been out 14 years, but still, or has it? Well, it's close, I guess. Still, um, I'm creating venues here, right? And a venue can have um, no parameters in the constructor or a string, the name of the venue, or a capacity, uh, uh, an integer. The, and you can also provide them both, like a classroom with capacity of 30. These methods are all doing the assertions. Well, we can also use lambda expressions to create the venues right here, and then just call get, right? Oh, but IntelliJ already su suggests to me, please turn this into a method reference, or we can do this for you if you want. So let's do it right here. But what do we do at this point when we want to provide a string parameter? Well, I, didn't, I honestly didn't know this by heart. But it turns out that if you create a method reference right here, you're asking, get me the constructor reference of the constructor that does not take any argument because I'm defining it as a supplier. Whereas in this case, you want the constructor that takes a string argument. So you don't have to make it a supplier, you have to make it a function actually, and uh, provide the string. And then the, you have to call apply instead of get. And then actually it works, while well, you have to provide a string value, of course. I, I literally learned this during studying of the certification, I never knew this, um, by heart actually. And for in this case, we have to provide an integer, of course, apply integer 200. And what would we need here when we want to pass two arguments, a string and an integer? Any ideas? Five. Very good, by function, very good. Thank you. In case I had forgotten already, you know it, you know it uh, already, so that's great. So let's apply it to uh, classroom, classroom and the integer literal 30. Moment of truth, because this was number one, so did I fix all tests? I certainly hope so. Oh, oh close one. What, what did I do here? It should print. Oh yeah, I know. I changed the production code and I still commented out. Yeah, of course, of course. Oh, that's it then. That's it, so all tests fixed, I'm assuming. Don't assume any, anything right, never. Um, but I hope that I've, uh, I've uh, taught you a few uh, Java tricks in 15 minutes. It took me over 14 years to learn, so uh, you definitely beat that record. If you like, uh, like the talk or want to play a bit with the code, you can go to the, the GitHub page. And if you want to contact me, here is my information. Have a great conference. Thank you.